Welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope you're as excited as I am. It's Wireless Tuesday. Wireless Tuesday is a monthly podcast that revolves around Cisco Wireless LAN and related technologies. It's a way for me and my colleagues on the Cisco Global Wireless team to give back to the community that's given us so much. My name is Jason Grant, and I am your host. Let's get it going. It's Wireless Tuesday. Welcome to the first episode of Wireless Tuesday for 2018. It is January 9th, and it is Wireless Tuesday. I'm Jason Grant. I am your host. I am here today with Javier Contreras and Salil Prabhu. These two guys are BU Escalation Engineers. So if you call into TAC and the problem that you are coming up with is one that has not either been seen by TAC before, might be a result of a bug, or something that just needs extra attention by the business unit, these are two of the guys that are going to be involved in that case. They have agreed to come in and talk about what they do for Wi-Fi troubleshooting and some of the top issues and some of the top tools that are used by TAC. So without further ado, I would like to hand the microphone over to Javier and Salil. They're going to be going back and forth uh, presenting uh, what is going to be some great content. Gentlemen. Good. Thank you, people, for, for joining us today. We, we will try to cover uh, a different set of, of very divergent data some, uh, that we were requested, uh, mostly recommended code, some troubleshooting tips, some scenarios that we, we have done over in the last few, few defects and how, how our internal teams were able to reproduce. Uh, so it will cover some, some beta program details and, and things that we need to uh, we are doing there to improve our field coverage, uh, some troubleshooting tools, and mostly journey of a lifetime of attack case, what needs to be done there, and also some part of some ASON testing that we do in technical profile te uh, testing that you will find quite, quite interesting. Next slide. So there is a, a big topic of what is the, the recommended code that we should be running on, on the WASLAN controllers. And of course, the answer has to be it depends. Uh, there are several main releases right now available on CCO. And what you actually should be using depends a lot of, of, of the use case. So for legacy hardware, legacy controllers, 8.0 remains to be the, 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 last, the last supported code. Any customer using 7.x should be moving into 8.0. And, and that is already MD release. Uh, right now, our last release is 8.0.152, and we are not planning uh, any further remarks. And this remain a fairly stable code for, for customers on, on legacy hardware. On the other hand, if you're running any uh, way to APs, you're running any of the new controllers, the, the recommended code right now is uh, 8.0.2.166, uh, which is 8.0.2.MR6, or the 802MR7 code, uh, which will be, be made public as an interim code very, very soon. Uh, the idea is 802 is, is a safe hardware release for, for Wave 2 uh, hardware. And so far, the results are, are, are really, really good. For people who need Apple features or new hardware support, they can use either uh, mostly 803, uh, 133.10. Uh, that is the, the safe code for uh, for Apple features right now, we already started last week the 803MR4 interim uh, public beta, so people can, can join and start using that and provide feedback. Uh, so far, the results are very good, and we have been working quite hard to remove any of the remaining issues on 803 for, for that uh, future MR4 release. Uh, for people who need um, DNA C, who need uh, latest features and support, 805-110 is the, the recommended code. Uh, so far, it's, it's looking good. Uh, we will have an 805-MR2 coming very, very soon, so by end of, of this month. We, are, we have already this available as an 805 uh, interim code, so for people as well can participate and provide, provide feedback. So summary, legacy hardware, 
anything in between not needing a Wave 2 or, or Apple features 802, a 166 or 167.x. And if you need the latest and greatest features uh, and, uh, or have the support 805, 110 or later, will be your, your choice. So you have these three options as a major, major train. Next slide. Okay, over to some key issues and how to troubleshoot. Next. So troubleshooting wireless uh, is very, very important to understand. There is no such a thing as a I cannot connect and a kind of problem that you can easily answer with, with just looking around. Wireless, when you look at as an overall, has a, it's a technology that has a very particular detail. It, it puts together different components from a lot of different vendors. So when you, you'd always be talking about the client, the client is divided between the chipset, the driver, the supplicant operating system implementation. Then you will be over, over here talking to an access point. You will be doing authentication. The access point is talking uh, camera to the controller, the authentication in the back end will be talking to radios, radios will be talking to some LDAP database in the end, you have ECP, DNS, so overall, something which is simply described as a wireless problem can be anything happening across all of these components. So it is important that you, the, whenever you do, you do troubleshooting, you cannot take this picture as a, as a whole blue blob, blob and start troubleshooting across all of this. It's impossible. So in wireless, it's always very, very important to split and divide the whole complexity into different points that you can go one by one and isolate the problem and then move forward. Uh, next. So the, the main, main troubleshooting process, uh, this applies for almost any technology, but in, in wireless because of the, how many different layers you may have involved. The main thing is top, define the problem. What I mean with this is, if you say, my wireless client cannot connect, that's a huge, incredible, big troubleshooting exercise. If you say, my Intel 8265 cannot connect to a 3800 access point over the 5 GHz radio when I enable aggregation, oh, that's quite different because you already defined your problem, you already remove noise, and you say it's a specific client. If I try a Mac OS, it works. If I try an uh, older Intel card, it works. If I try a new Intel card, I see the problem. Oh, that's a huge difference. You are defining the problem very, very precisely. And it's normal when you open a tag case, you say, you, you put a very broad problem description, clients cannot connect, and through an iteration of different questions, the problem is more and more refined until you have a very specific problem, like Intel 8265 cannot connect on 5 year high, blah, blah, blah. And that is an iterative process that needs to happen. And how good or, or how quickly is the tag case progress will totally depend or how good is the problem definition because the whole progress will be completely different. After you got this problem definition, you got these questions gone, there will be some isolation for the root cause, some tests. The test will have an iteration between test, analysis, until we we understand better the problem, and we find the root cause. The, the most important things to, to help simplify this, this whole set of iterations is, one, we need to, it's important to know what is the expected behavior, how it should be working, understanding the technology. Second, we need to, if it's something that can be reproduced, it's easier for, for the customer, for the tech, for engineering development to, to solve the whole problem. Sometimes the, the, you will see later in, in this presentation some reproduction uh, scenarios that we have done. Sometimes reproduction, the customer will tell me, oh, it's completely random. It happens, uh, I, we don't know where. There's always some trigger. Here we are, deterministic uh, physics. We, we don't believe on, on random uh, scenarios. There has to be some trigger. There has to be something that triggers the problem. Sometimes it's roaming between one room to the other that which is translating on which channel sets or which power levels the clients are seeing, how many vehicles the, the client is hearing. This, and that reproduction info will help a lot of understanding what is the root cause. Most important, don't jump into conclusions. That's something that all human beings, we, we tend to do it a, a lot. And it's important to iterate and avoid jumping, avoid saying, oh, we will upgrade because this sounds like this. Mm, before upgrading, it's important to clarify the problem, isolate very, very well the root cause, and then to avoid wasting time and avoid introducing noise in the whole process. 
Next. Okay, this over to you, Salil. Okay, thanks, Xavier. Uh, so, yeah, so what we are trying to do is we're trying to cover uh, three cases. Uh, typical uh, cases where which any customer would run into it and how do you go about uh, you know going through defining the problem trying to understand the problem and what do you do to solve this problem right so this was one uh, case uh, which was reported by one of the big retail customers where at a very random time they said we have some APs uh, which would not connect to the controller. And that was the problem definition given back uh, by the customer. They said it's so random that we don't know what's happening, right? So what happened at the back end was, uh, you know, the tax started troubleshooting this uh, things and we got involved and we started digging more and more into insights of the customer network, right? So what we found out was uh, this specific case, they had, they had a Meraki router or a firewall, which was natting between two WAN connections uh, with data DTLS enabled. And what we got information by digging more from specific sites that reported problems was there was in, during the time this problem was reported, during the vicinity of the time, they had van flaps, meaning you had a perfectly good van connection, all of a sudden switch back to LTE, and then back to the original van connection. So we got a clue uh, to begin with that there must be a condition where when we are doing a van flap, the APs for some reason are not able to establish the DTLS connection back. Uh, so we started thinking about, hey, what do you do to kind of simulate this environment and to collect some additional information to kind of root cause the problem? Uh, again, this is random production site, so it's impossible for us to use a customer to uh, mimic uh, their production environment to do any tests, right? So we thought through and, uh, you know, one of the important things what we did was we said, okay, it's a specific firewall which relies on Linux-based system, right? And one of the important things that we, uh, we know from Linux-based firewalls are they don't maintain the source port assignments from the access point. That was one clue what we used and we had a free tools available online, which is one is TFSense, uh, and you can Google it to find out more details about it if you guys are not aware on it. But we kind of created a similar environment of basically creating set of access points, connecting to a switch, and, and the TFSense acts as a WAN simulator. And what we did was we basically created two WANs using this PF sense. So when an access point was toggled to go between the two WAN connections, we found that we created the race conditions uh, by adding additional scripts to basically flip between two WAN connections to create this condition. So in a nutshell, you know, a summary of this was uh, you know, we, you have a very big problem description. You try to disseminate into a very smaller pieces and then took those pieces and build it a lab to kind of understand what the problems are. So this effectively not only helps uh, maintain our customer trust uh, in terms of efficiency to find the true root cause and also at the same time from the engineering side, you can, ex you can expand these uh, uh, situations more to understand what possibly is happening in the net, in the in the background. So it ultimately ended where you had a situation on the controller where the AP was having multiple DTLS connections and for which uh, the controller was not accepting this new DTLS session. So there was stale DTLS sessions happening on the controller as a matter of toggling between two WAN connections. 
uh, I think this is one case. Uh, the second interesting case what we received recently was with the 3800 access points, this is a university where a customer was trying to use our new access points, the 28 3800s, and he was kind of mimicking about 30 clients in a classroom kind of an environment, and they were trying to deliver a content for the students. And what they started as a problem description was, hey, if I use your newer access points, uh, I'm seeing this high latency, this high channel utilization, and I'm not even able to surf the internet. Uh, we kind of thought through, I said, okay, we've done similar tests in our environment. We've done uh, similar validations with other customers, other devices. What, what is unique? What is that we were not able to find with this specific customer? Uh, we started digging more and more, uh, and they were using combination of uh, i devices, your Apple iPads, to Androids, to Samsungs, and to some Intel Mac laptops. And what we found in this interesting case was that majority of the clients that they were using were an older 11N clients, which wasn't made aware to us originally until we started digging up more and more about trying to mimic the exact lab environment to their setup. And what we found was there was a bug in the access point where it was basically if the client was advertising that it supported only 4K AMSTU packet in the association request, we were trying to go beyond the 4K, and what the client was doing was for these packets, it was basically discarding these packets. So ultimately, you ended up having a lot of data retries, a lot of packets getting uh, retries across different clients, and also overall channel utilization and QBSS got impacted. So this small granularity of detail, when we saw this in our labs, we were kind of very surprised, and we found there was a known issue around this that we resolved in later parts of uh, 8.3 code. So overall, in our journey of this problem, it took us quite a bit of time to kind of understand uh, by dropping individual pieces of different clients to try and find out where the problems are. Uh, okay, that was the second use case. Uh, uh, moving on to one of the last use cases, uh, this was uh, reported by one of enterprise customers uh, who was kind of uh, trying Skype for business, and uh, he came with an interesting problem description. And uh, this customer was very, uh, you know, clear on what the problem was, in the sense that he said, hey, when I use your access points and when I do Skype for business, uh, more likely I will start seeing a drop in my calls, and this is very easy to see in, in the way I'm trying to do this. But if I don't do Skype, everything seems to be fine. Uh, we started uh, understanding, you know, looking back into our dev test, what we have done. Uh, we saw, okay, we've covered the Skype for business, so what's unique about this customer? What's unique that he can easily reproduce this problem? And what we found out was they had uh, certain feature uh, called optimized roaming enabled, which was forcing the clients to disassociate, even though they were at a very good RSSI. So, how do you simulate this case? Uh, you know, so what we did was we we thought of an innovative idea of using our universal workgroup bridge and our AVC profiles on the controller to kind of simulate voice traffic without actually doing any Skype for business. So we were trying to do 
pings or the Wi-Fi through the universal workgroup bridge. And what we were doing is we were trying to mark the ping packet as a voice priority. So similarly, on the workgroup bridge as a client, we created policy map for the ICMP to be marked as voice. So indirectly, you didn't need any Skype for business. You created a voice stream by using just the ping packet. And what we observed was if we waited about close to 90 seconds, which is when the optimized roaming uh, profile stats payload comes in, we saw the clients were getting kicked out at a very good RSSI of NEC 55. So what was unique? Why NEC 55? So what we found was there was a logical problem in coding uh, where we took the one that I highlighted as voice packet percentage of 50%, we classified that as NEC 50 dBm. So any client that was NEC 50 or a higher would immediately start getting kicked out within 90 seconds if he was doing a voice call. So this was an interesting learning. Uh, it took us some time to understand. Uh, we started with initial debug on the controllers. We found they had the optimized roaming that triggered this disassociate. Then we started investi investigating why this disassociate came even though the client was at a very good RSSI. So that was, uh, these were like some of the interesting use cases uh, in terms of how we tackle them. Uh, moving on to the next one, uh, I think this was uh, one of the third things in our uh, agenda was what are we doing different with what's called as engineering driven beta? What's unique and why did we have to do this? Uh, you know, what we found uh, before was a lot of, uh, you know, beta-driven feedback was mostly surrounding people using 99% uh, or close to maybe, you know, most of them were labs and people were giving very less feedback in terms of uh, how the feature was or sometimes you would get very concentrated feedback around the feature. But overall, when we released this software on CCOs, we were hitting a lot of you know, issues around these features or overall that specific uh, mainline release. So what we thought was we started basically creating what's called as production validation of, of these beta codes. So we took few dedicated, I mean, we, we got volunteers from different verticals from different customers who said, hey, I would like to be part of this engineering engagement to help uh, engineering and work with us to kind of provide this feedback, right? So that's there we started this initiative of uh, what's called as uh, engineering driven beta. So we talk directly with the customers, we, uh, we help them, you know, give them the codes, we help them maintain if there are any issues, we help troubleshoot directly at the engineering side. So there's in, in lieu of this, what we've also done, and I think Javier will cover in the next few slides, is some of automated data collection and parsing stuff that we built to kind of collect data from these customers that are partners helping us or helping together to build a stable code when we release this on the CCO. So what it ended up, uh, what it ended up was we started finding a lot of complex bugs initially directly being worked with the customer and at the engineering side. And that helped us build really good initial CCO builds out there. Uh, yeah, so this is what we built the framework. So if anyone is interested, do let us know. 
uh, we'll be more than happy to enroll you in this program, work with you directly to participate in this early beta feedback, incorporate your feedback, and also help you if there are any issues with the beta codes. Uh, so as part of this framework, we built some of the automation tools like, I think you guys will be familiar with the you know, config analyzer that Javier has built. And there's also, in addition, some scripts built to collect data and uh, there's some automation tools being built to parse this data to find out if you really have issues and how to dissect those issues to, uh, to the bottom of it. Similarly, we built some of the KPI in terms of to say, hey, we put these many customers and these are our success, what we've seen, right? So these are our production beta customers, which we started around 8 to MR4 and 8.4 time frame. So we saw pretty good uh, feedback from, from the field when we reached 8 to MR5, MR6, and similarly to our mainline uh, codes. Uh, I think some of the data parsing and some of the automation tools I'll hand over to Javier uh, to cover these. Uh, sure. So what we, we the idea we had here was um, instead of waiting for for customers to get the feedback from their users about how oh, was the network going and so on, we we started developing a set of scripts to collect health data from both access point and controllers. Initially, we, we, did, we did this for handling cases with very, very big customers. So we had a, a service provider which had about 64,000 access points, and we needed to do analysis across all of them. Of course, you will not go and do a counter to each access point one by one because that's unbelievable. And you, you cannot go and, and just uh, see the logs for 64,000 access points. It just doesn't, doesn't scale. That doesn't work. And there is so low-level data on the radio side, statistics about client, SNR, radio resets, radio behavior, buffers, queues, but a whole bunch of data that their APs had, which is normally not exposed on high-level applications like Prime or even on the SIM controller. So we created a set of data folder pools, both for putting the data and parsing the data, that we go through, we connect to a controller, pull the access point list, and we'll go to each access point and, and, and start pulling information, commands, crash file, core files, uh, DFS statistics, and bring this information back to us and see what's going on. So this allows us to do a huge amount of, of raw data for any access point. We can do this on, on, on a production environment. It's a low impact scenario. And this allows us to, to uncover a, a lot of, of low-level details. So, for example, for the scenario of A2, MR4, MR5, MR6, uh, we uncovered there about 16 different real reset problems that we gradually re, uh, remove from each uh, uh, version iteration, removing more and more problems for, for this customer. So we were monitoring of um, every bug data was 6,000 APs in a, in a single go. Can you go next slide, Salil? So, for example, one, one famous bug we, we had, which a big problem, uh, we, we, have, we're, we were seeing this only on, on big deployments, like airports or, or universities with very, very large uh, client counts. And we saw that APs were stopping to, to serve clients. And this was when the AP was being exposed to thousands of different devices a day. So in a typical enterprise environment when you have the same devices across a, a day, the same 100 devices across a day, you never see this. But when you have the AP on a public venue, when thousands of devices go on, on, uh, in, every day, like an airport, um, the AP goes to a moment that stops servicing clients. What you see is the, the AP will not forward best effort traffic anymore. So the client can try to associate, and then you have no IP address, no ARP, nothing. So we started collecting this data from, from those airports, and we were able to isolate this behavior and get a fix done for 802MR6 and 803MR3 timeframes. You go, next slide. Uh, the IO slash hunt, that's another problem we have seen on, on, on deployments which have been up and running for a long time. AP detects a problem on the flash. AP can continue to work and service clients. So you see the AP is operating, 
but there is no, it's not possible to write to the flash anymore. So this, the same thing. We were working with an um, iOS uh, data folder, and we discovered which scenarios were triggering the issue, and we have a set of, a set of uh, fixes. It was not a single fix, a set of fixes that have been rolled over in A3 MR3, and they will be, they are already present on A5 MR1, and they will be in MR4 and A2 MR6, MR7. Okay, next slide. Some other troubleshooting tools that we, we, we tell people to, to have. Um, number one, wireless sniffer traces. That's a mandatory thing to have. Right now, the best sniffer trace is going to be an access point. Uh, that is, uh, you can put them on a sniffer mode and allows you to capture everything which is uh, around you. Um, the, the main thing as well, uh, the spectrum analyzer, any access point with a clean air support can, be, can, be, can act as a spectrum analyzer on, on SC mode. That's also very, very useful when you are troubleshooting RF interference. I mean, you have an access point, you already have two troubleshooting tools. And the most important thing you can imagine when you are troubleshooting client issues is the debug client. So whenever you're talking about to, uh, to tag about a, a client problem, the first thing to collect before you open a tag case is having a debug client capture when the problem happens, that immediately will give us a, a very, very good idea and reduce the problem description a lot. Uh, next one. So whenever you talk to TAC, uh, there, there are different, uh, it's important to know what are the expectations and, and how things should, should be done. Uh, TAC is a, is a, let's say, find and fix organization. The idea is to isolate problems, do bug identification, to provide you a workaround and a fix. Very important. That has to provide an action plan to resolve this, uh, the, 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 re the request, which means it's their responsibility to ensure that you have a clear set of instructions, clear ETA, and what is expected from you to be able to solve the problem. That's, if they don't provide an action plan, they, they, are the, they, say they will be receiving a lot of pressure from, from their management. So be, care, be, be sure that you should always uh, get a clear action plan from them. On the same time, from your side, it's important that you provide a clear problem description so they can work with it. Uh, TAC has to involve us. So our team escalation is basically what is sitting between TAC and engineering. So whenever TAC has a, a new defect, a new code is needed, or is something that has to be involved by a result by engineering analysis, is what when uh, TAC will engage our team and we will be working together to solve the, the issue. Now, things that should not be asking TAC is design problems or RF scanning, because RF scanning needs to be on site, needs to have the RF visibility. Also, feature requests. That is, cannot do a feature. Feature request has to be channeled through the account teams, so they can be uh, properly documented and presented to the product management, so okay, they can be included on, on, on the ECL. Next slide. Um, tag escalation process uh, is important. The, the idea is there is always like a out, uh, inside tag there are three lay, layers of, of escalation before they go to, to the view. Uh, you may see a single person talking to you, depending on, on, on which team, because tag has different teams across the world. Uh, and they are slightly different, but the idea in general is they have three internal layers uh, of escalation. And after the team leads are involved, they go to us for view escalation. Uh, you can always request them to, to engage, but it's very important in any time you're not satisfied with the tax feedback, you can always talk to duty manager. Duty manager is an all powerful being that can help a lot if you are really having a, a, a problem. The part of the priority is, is, is very, very important. The customer sets the escape priority. Of course, it's important that this is reflecting the real business impact. If you are writing a 71 for a cosmetic issue, that doesn't fly. But if you, but if you have a, a crash, if you're having a memory leak, if a feature is preventing uh, you to do your business uh, uh, functions, hey, that is important. You need to reflect this uh, to the tag. If, if, if the problem is becoming uh, impacting, it's important to engage your account team because account team, sometimes, tag is very technical. Account team will have a better uh, view of the business impact and what can happen. And they are uh, like a third party, which is good to have involved. So they can provide this additional feedback. And when we are involved, the engineering is involved, 
We also want to hear about the, the account team to see how this is hurting you. Next slide. More latest uh, software releases, and which comes from, from the tag involvement, uh, it's important for you to, to understand what kind of software the, you, you can be running and, and how this is, um, this is reflecting on the CCO. There are two types of official builds. One is ED and MD. Everything is ED on the, on the, when it's first released. And the idea is the few code trains, meaning, for example, A3, A5, those are MD targets, which means they will be marketed as a general use code. A.0 right now is MD target already. Um, 803 is a candidate, which means we want 803 to reach a general usage kind of uh, quality. And our idea is that 803 MR4, 803 MR5, either depending on how they evaluate, should be MD tag. The same goes for 805. 805 should be MD level after it reaches code maturity, which should be reaching about between MR4, MR5. Um, other releases like A1, A2, a, A4, A6 are short-lived. They will never get MD. We will not plan to do any MD. 802 was kind of a special scenario that we had more MRs to be able to ensure way to APs reach code stability. So that was an exception. But in general, short-life releases should get one, two MRs and long-life releases like MD targets, A3, A5, they should get at a minimum five or more uh, MR releases. The MD tag is an extremely serious process that has to be signed up by tag, escalation, AS, product marketing. So we have different teams involved on signing. And a minimum, we will evaluate MD quality between 10 to 16 weeks after it's on CCO. And before we, 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 we do the evaluation, the release has to go through a hardening regarding testing and bug fixing before it's, uh, we, we submit for, for uh, MD evaluation. So MD tags are normally extremely uh, serious matter to, before we, we grant it. Now, between CCO releases, you, you may hit a problem. That's when we get escalation builds. So escalation builds handled by our team. The idea is we take a copy of the CCO code and we fix hot issues that customers are re reporting and we deliver this through tag. These are fully stack supported. It's a CCO code plus uh, hand picket fixes, which we manually test. So the idea is, this is what we have in between MR, so you can solve critical problems until the next MR is available. Fully supported, same code as CCO, just specific uh, fixes. Next slide. Okay, some customer testing. Salil, yours? Yes, sure. So what we have done, there's some level of uh, differentiation in testing we've done is, um, you know, you have a lot of unit testing, system tests, you have uh, regression tests, you have, uh, you know, feature tests. What we have done is there's one level of additional test approach we took is to kind of do a profiles or customer profiles testing. So we created like about five to six verticals of different customers and we picked between these verticals different set of customers, right? And uh, we defined, we, we talked to them, we got their configurations, we got their client types, we understood their use cases, and we said, hey, we would like to use those uh, information in our labs to test that for you, so in, in future when we release any MRs or a mainline release, we are covering that level of testing. So what it happened was this kind of helped both from test organization perspective to understand the real use cases, what the customers are doing, and catch the bugs early enough before even a customer catches. So if you have any interest for your customers uh, that you think you would like us to work with you, do let us know. Uh, we'll be more than happy to, uh, you know, collaborate with you to see what we can incorporate. But this is one of the newest additions what we did in our labs. Uh, some of the 
you know, these are some of the pictures from our labs, uh, but this is what we broke down in terms of, uh, let's say an example as an university or an enterprise configuration. So we picked, I mean, this is a sample of maybe like nine customers, what they're trying to do, and we kind of use this information to build what's called as profile labs. So not only it covers the use cases what they're using, but at the same time it helps build confidence internally and also externally when we deliver a code out in the field. Uh, I, I think some of these are basically going over what are the test beds uh, and uh, pictures about what we have from our profile test perspective. This is specifically centered around profiles, so uh, I, I won't go over details about what we have. I think we'll just keep it to flash, but uh, Overall, uh, I think these are what we have uh, from shield room perspective to create uh, live uh, real clients to mimic different chambers to do, let's say, uh, you know, MU MIMO or clean air or, or any of these technologies, right? So these are all test beds that we put some pictures of you to show you that what we are trying to do as part of the profiles. I uh, think we are almost uh, done with the slides. I uh, think Jason, probably I'll hand it over to you back. Uh, so maybe, let me, let me ask this question if you guys don't mind. The next time a customer calls into the TAC, um, you give us a pretty good rundown of, of what they need to provide. Uh, and you gave me a pretty good idea of um, uh, kind of the process. Um, is there a point which, um, like, let's just say that for whatever reason, um, I feel as a customer my tech case is getting stalled. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just not getting anywhere, or at least not making the headway that I need to make. What are the kinds of things that I can do to escalate before you guys get involved? So obviously like when things are really broken and it actually has something to do with perhaps a, a bug or uh, you know something more than a misconfiguration, what kind of things can I do as a customer to kind of escalate before it ends up getting to you? So in, in general, the, I would say, number one, when you open a tag case, be sure that your product description is clear and as concise as possible, that that will help everybody enormously. Second, if you have a crash, for example, make sure that you open the, uh, the case already with a crash file and if possible the core DOM. If you have a client problem, try to add a, in the beginning, show run config, debug, debug client, and, and from the beginning so you can save a lot of time. That's how the starting point. So if, if the things are done, let's say, as clean as possible from the start, things will go well. Now, the, case, the typical cases that reach to us are things which are composite scenarios, meaning customer says, oh, my clients are disconnecting, uh, I'm having a hard time doing this and that, and then you start digging and you see that the, the, the tag was looking into this and they were doing that, and, and when you start looking into the problem, you see a combination of bad RF plus rate reset plus client having a, a client side aggregation problem plus DFS event, so you have like four or five different elements together when you see them from above, everything you look at is, oh, my clients are disconnecting and my applications are failing to work. But when you start uncovering one by one, you start making progress little by little, everything is because you have too many variables and the problems were not separated between each other. So you, you did not, uh, you, you were trying to troubleshoot everything at the same time. If you try to do everything at the same time, you have a 100% certainty that it will, it will be rotten immediately and will go, go bad. The second set of problems we normally see, and that happens to us as well, is sometimes we are, have not made the proper question to understand what was the trigger. Uh, for example, sometimes uh, you got this, oh, uh, AP is not connecting to controller, it's disconnecting frequently, and you, people start troubleshooting the, the, the DTLS connection and so on, and even nobody made a question, okay, is the MTU the same across the AP and controller the whole day long? 
or oh, and then we, we start digging, oh yeah, yeah, because customer has multiple paths. So this making questions is also very important. Yeah, somebody had a question. So when um, when I'm calling in and perhaps uh, we've we've kind of gone through the questions that we that we know to ask. I'm thinking we as in like the customer calling in. I maybe maybe all maybe all of that's not so exposed. Uh, but also maybe I can't get a hold of the tech engineer or. Uh, we're just not we're we're just not communicating. Is it is it okay? At, at what point should I ask for a new engineer or say can we escalate this? Um, what, what's sure. your opinion there? So whenever you're not getting a clear action plan uh, or the action plan is not feasible, in those scenarios you you can either talk to to request to talk to the um, Tag manager, and I, I tell you, tag managers. I have talk, I have worked with all of them across the world. They do take feedback very, very seriously. They will. They love to talk to the customers and, and improve as much as possible. No exceptions. So if you are not getting a clear action plan, or the action plan is requesting you to uh, kill a cat in the middle of the night on a Monday night, uh, mm -hmm. which is completely impossible, then okay, you stop. Guys, I want to talk to your manager, or if the guy doesn't want to, you just call and ask for the duty manager, and they will sort you out. Okay, so that would say action plan has to be clear. You should be able to do it. Uh, if action plan is unclear because the, the root cause is not understood and the, the, the comments which have been requested doesn't make any sense, uh, talk to the manager, or and, and he will get you involved to the next level of escalation, either inside tag on, on to us, to make sure you get the, the attention and the resources to solve the problem. So we had another question that's along that vein. Um, let's just say that we've identified a bug. What should the ex expectation be for resolution time? Okay, between a, a bug identified and a bug uh, uh, and a fixed code, there's a lot of variation. So if you are hitting a well-known defect and a defect is already included in escalation code, you will get escalation code in no time. So meaning it's already there and whatever takes the attack to, to send you the code. It's a completely new defect. Uh, it depends. Some defects can be solved in a, in a relatively short time. After we have the, uh, it, it all will depend on if we can reproduce and we can isolate the RCA. If, the, if for example, you're getting something like a radio reset, which is only happening with a particular client type, with a particular roaming behavior, and with a particular traffic type is happening, Hey, that can be weeks of lab work to reproduce and isolate the trigger. So that is difficult. Or, on the other hand, you tell me, uh, we got a crash, and we got a core dump, and the crash is in a, a null point in assignment. Hey, we can probably fix that in, in 24 hours and deliver the code to you between code commit, code fix, and image creation, deliver, and so on, in less than a week. So there's a lot of variation. Normally, and, and, and that code, by the way, is going to be called an escalation build. Yeah, right? yeah. It's always, it's and, always, always. The, we try to go through escalation code because and, that's important. So, so I heard you talk about version numbers, and I know that there's four parts to a version number. There's the like 8.3, that would be a code train uh, yep. dot, and then um, you know 134 or something like that, and then the stuff that's on CCO on Cisco.com. Is always going to be dot zero, right? And then Correct. if I have something that's not dot zero at the end, it means it's an escalation build that came from from your team, right? Okay. The, the, let's be technically precise. Um, you have yes, you're right. The 8.3, 8.2 represent the, the the main version family. Inside that version family, you will have multiple. Uh, releases happening, normally what we call maintainer releases, MRs. So you have MR1, MR2, MR3. When the MR hits CCO, it will be always be one MR number zero. So MR1 is going to be 110, MR2 is going to be MR3, uh, sorry, MR2 is going to be 120, and so forth and so on. Builds, normally, uh, you do MR3, for example, 130.0. And you decide, you, you start working on the MR4. That's going to be 134.x, for example. And you every day to do a new build, so it's going to be 134.1, 134.2, and so on. Escalation uh -huh. codes are always the same version number as the CCO plus something. So, for example, the CCO is 
802.166.0, escalation will be 166.1, 166.2, and so on. So that is the numbering. It's a little bit complex, but it's very precise to know what the code is from. Externally, what customers will see will be always only CTO code or escalation code, because those are what the warranty can be supported, meaning code that if you have a crash, we will have simple files to understand what was the crash trigger. That is very, very important. And very important as well, we also have a list of specific fixes that have gone into either CCO or escalation. So customer facing will always be either escalation or CCO. So the third, so. third okay. line, which is beta, the beta code, beta code interim builds will also be available, but those are limited in life, okay? And those will be controlled access through the beta program. Those also you may receive as well. That's only the three things that should be visible externally. Great, great. Hopefully, uh, we never have to send in a crash file. Um, <laughs> but if we do, it's good to know what the process is, and uh, kind of the, the you know how how solutions are are are, are fixed. Now, um, changing the uh, changing direction a little bit, uh, we kind of flew through the tools. Um, uh, uh, Jim, thanks for making that comment. Um, can you uh, maybe bring up that slide that had the, had some of the tools on it? And uh, is there like a like a go to uh, tool or a couple of tool sets that you kind of always have with you? Yeah. So uh, this is a little bit of self uh, sponsoring. So there's a one line content analyzer that we always run. That is a standalone Windows tool. Uh, that is very good for uh, doing a, a, a good understanding of your RF configuration settings, problems, and so on. Uh, this tool has a, a, let's say, automatic tag. So whenever you send a show run config or a show tag to the tag case, automatically, immediately, the, we will run the, um, your file through the, the internal version of the config analyzer. Uh, we will do additional availability of this internal version with, with other features in the next uh, few few weeks. But they say the Config Analyzer right now remains the, the main tool uh, to be to run as the first thing. How to find easy configuration errors, easy RF problems in a, in, in in few seconds. That is what TAC will see in the TAC case automatically whenever you send a show run config into into the case. So you can do this by your own. So there's no need to wait. Um, as a second set of tools, uh, Wireshark and the bug client are the two next things that you do together, and these are really, really important to get familiar with. We, there is some documentation explaining how to read a, a, a debug client, and Tag has some cloud tools that can help you understand the bug client sections and, and how they flow. Uh, I don't have the link at hand. I can send you to uh, uh, offline, and you can make it public if you want later on. Thank you. I will, um, uh, everybody, so these links, I will take these links and I'll put them in the, um, uh, in the link with the recording. So you have all of these. You don't have to, you know, transfer them down by hand. Uh, you'll have them on a web page. Um, Javier, so little. Thank you so much for your time. I know that uh, Sue Neal, um, whose name sounds very familiar, uh, similar to your name, Salil, uh, I know he was going to join us today and uh, fell ill uh, overnight, so I wish him the best. Uh, Javier, thank you so much for stepping in at the last minute. Uh, I found this extremely informative, and uh, I hope that, uh, that everyone else, I hope that you found it as formative as, as I did. I. Here's one of the reasons why I love Wireless Tuesday is because every single time I get someone, I try to get someone way smarter than me, which is normally pretty easy to do. Uh, but I learn something new every single time, and I always take something away. Um, if if you learned something today, would you drop me a note? I'd love to know what you thought, what uh, what your opinions are. Uh, you can always hit me up on uh, on Twitter at Shudo Strike, or you can hit me on email at jagrant@cisco.com. This has been the first recording of the 2018 season of Wireless Tuesday. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, everybody have a great month and a great rest of your Wireless Tuesday. 
This has been a presentation of Cisco's Wireless Tuesday. Be sure to continue the conversation by going to CiscoFullBars.com and at the top, clicking on the CFB Spark Community. There you can connect with scores of other like-minded wireless LAN professionals. And be sure to subscribe to the Wireless Tuesday podcast using your favorite podcast utility. And get always up to date by subscribing to the Wireless Tuesday newsletter at wirelesstuesday.fm. We will see you next month for another exciting episode of Wireless Tuesday.